the H blocks of the Mays prison just outside Belfast. Inside, a four-year protest by IRA men is reaching its climax. Seven convicted prisoners today started the fifth week of a hunger strike, which could be the final test of strength between the British government and the IRA. Their fellow prisoners beat out a bizarre greeting as Weldon Action is allowed to interview the hunger strikers for the first time. This is Brendan Hughes, their leader, a former commander of the Belfast Brigade of the IRA. The seven prisoners say they will starve themselves to death if the British government doesn't yield to their demands for special treatment as political prisoners. The government insists they will not do so. They say the men are criminals convicted by due process of law. The protest is also visible outside the prison. Supporters of the hunger strikers have taken to the streets of Northern Ireland in their thousands. Ancient loyalist fears have been aroused by the sight of Republicans on the march. In the shadows, Protestant paramilitary groups say they're making preparations for the final confrontation. As the hunger strikers near the critical stage, the atmosphere will become more tense in Northern Ireland. Uh, each rally and each march will become more uh, agitated. The temperature will rise, the frustration will become more intense. And eventually there will be a confrontation. Londonderry, 12 days ago. The hunger strike has caused the biggest demonstration here for years. To many, it's a reminder of the civil rights marches of 12 years ago. There were some things we put forward in the past and didn't win when we needed to win them, and it didn't matter all that much. We could still go on. We could recover. But I don't believe that we can afford to lose this one, not only because of the possibility of our own people dying in long cash cells and possibly in our mat too, but because if we lose this one in a real sense, we will have lost everything that was fought for over this past 12 years. Until the hunger strike began, there was little public support for the prisoners' demands for political status. In loyalist strongholds like the Newtonards Road in East Belfast, the ranks are closing. This is the headquarters of the Ulster Defence Association, the largest loyalist paramilitary organisation. The UDA also wants special treatment for their own prisoners, many of whom have murdered Catholics. But a senior UDA member, John McMichael, explains why they bitterly oppose the IRA's H-Block campaign. Uh, we believe that the Provos are perhaps playing their last card, their last big card, and unfortunately it's a trump card, and that the H-Block situation has provided them with the one uh, great propaganda weapon that they've been left with. If we look at Republican history, it feeds on oppression, it feeds on martyrdom. Over the last few years, uh, while the provosts have been tolerated by the nationalist community in the traditional fight against the British, their campaign has been dwindling away, their support has been dwindling, because nationalism uh, and the fight for the struggle for Irish unity has always needed some focal point where the nationalist spirit could home in, and the H-Block situation provides this. Uh, as Bernadette Michaleski has said, will provide the spark which will uh, explode Ulster into a united iron. It's the last confrontation with the British. In 1916, people walked into the General Post Office in Dublin and Britain made the same mistake she's making today. Britain thought that she could take those people to a place of execution and shoot them and break the heart and spirit of the Irish resistance movement. When she allowed those seven people to die, she did not break the spirit of resistance in Ireland. She fanned the spark into a flame that spread this country and freed 26 counties of it. The reappearance of speakers like Bernadette McCallisky has aroused suspicion throughout the loyalist community. Marlene Jefferson, the moderate unionist mayor of Londonderry. I don't think she's here to do any good anyhow. What? Remember, it all started in this city before. And we've had 10 years of progress. And a lot of hard work was done by a lot of decent people. And suddenly she appears on the scene again. And if Britain lets one man or woman die in those prisons, she may well find the same spark that burns today and has burned ever since in this country into one more 
flee on of resistance that will free 32 counties and build a country we can all live in. I think it's going to drive a deeper wage, possibly than ever before. Speakers who've been in the background for years are returning to the stage as part of the Provisionals' campaign to unite Catholics against the British. Few Catholics have dared to oppose the rising emotion. One is Jerry Fitt, Member of Parliament for West Belfast. In relation to Irish history, a hunger strike is a very, very emotional issue. And we are hearing all the sort of cliches of, do you want to see a coffins being carried out of Long Cash? Well, over this past 10 years, 12 years, I have carried many coffins, both Protestants and Catholics, out of little villages and churchyards throughout Northern Ireland. And to the relatives who were left behind then, the loss of their loved ones was just as serious as that which may be occasioned by the death of the hunger strikers. I do not believe that the hunger strikers are justified in demanding special treatment after committing the crimes which they did. The hunger strikers refuse to accept that they're criminals. They want to return to the old days when all IRA men lived like prisoners of war in the compounds of Long Kesh. In 1971, the army had introduced internment and many IRA suspects were imprisoned without trial. Then in 1972, Northern Ireland Secretary William Whitelaw faced a mass hunger strike by convicted IRA men wanting the same concessions as the hunger strikers today. He conceded them special category status and so convicted prisoners joined the internees in Long Kesh. Well, in 1971, on the 9th of August, internment had taken place in Northern Ireland. And undoubtedly this had drawn an awful lot of young people for very emotional reasons and very justifiable reasons had drawn them into the conflict. Special category was conceded in June of 1972 and within three weeks I sat in a telev television studio here in Belfast and looked at what had happened on Bloody Friday where 130 people were injured in an awful bombing campaign on Bloody Friday. I watched the people shoveling up the remains of people who had been killed in the Oxford Street bomb. That was when I realised that special category wasn't going to end the violence. It was, it was only going to give some justification to those who were continuing to do that. In 1976, Merlin Rees, then Northern Ireland Secretary, introduced a policy of criminalisation, pushing the police into the front line and moving the army into the background. The aim of the new policy was to convict terrorists in the courts and treat them as ordinary criminals. Special category status was abolished and internment without trial ended. Special legislation was used, special powers to detain and interrogate suspects for up to seven days. Cases were heard before special courts known as Diplock courts, where a judge sits alone without a jury. When emergency legislation was introduced, at the House of Commons in, in Westminster. Indeed, a very uh, unlikely colleague of mine, uh, Dr Paisley, Mr Paisley, he and I moved an amendment to ensure that juries were still kept in Northern Ireland. But one of the first cases that we had was an IRA case to the hijacking of a bus. And the key witness in that case was a bus driver, a bus conductor come driver. And on the day before the case was heard, the bus driver was shot dead in a very, very brutal way. That, in my estimation, justified the abolition of juries because juries were under, they were under duress, they were being attacked by provisional extremists, by IRA and by loyalist extremists, and there's absolutely no doubt that juries were subjected to intimidation. Since 1976, thousands of people have been convicted, the majority solely on the evidence of confessions made in police interrogation centres. Allegations that police extracted some confessions by beating up suspects were investigated by a government commission two years ago. It concluded that there were cases where suspects sustained injuries in police custody which could not have been self-inflicted. Recommendations to help safeguard suspects' rights were implemented. Criminalisation continued. It's brought the British government some success. Violence has dropped. Shootings down from over 10,000 in 1972 to under 600 so far this year. Troop levels have been halved. The police, albeit protected by soldiers, are beginning to move into some Republican areas once dominated by the IRA. We asked Michael Allison, Minister of State for Northern Ireland, if the government's stand against the hunger strike might reverse this progress. 
No, I think it's precisely because we have treated and the broad communities on both sides have accepted that it was right to treat terrorists as terrorists and murderers that we have got to the degree of success we have got and that the terrorists are making this last throw, as it were, to try to divert us and to get some more support back. Their numbers are way down. Their capacity for striking is obviously extremely limited. I think they are um, on the run. But I must be careful because it's been said before and uh, human beings are capable of springing surprises. The hunger strike in the H-blocks is a battle for the hearts and minds of the Catholic population. For the British government, it's a chance to demonstrate that the IRA are a spent force. For the IRA, the hunger strike is a last opportunity to win back popular support with their traditional final gesture of defiance. The Brit British will never understand that defeat is a word we do not understand the meaning of. It is a word we have never recognized. The seven hunger strikers have been hand-picked for this final confrontation with the British government. All but one are senior IRA men and all are serving long sentences. Brendan Hughes, possession of arms and explosives with intent to endanger life. Sentence, 15 years. Thomas McKearney, murder, possession of arms and ammunition with intent to endanger life. Assault, sentence, life imprisonment with a minimum recommendation of 25 years. John Nixon, member of the Irish National Liberation Army. Two charges of armed robbery. Sentence, 14 years. Sean McKenna, two charges of attempted murder. Bombings, kidnapping, hijacking, possession of arms and ammunition, conspiracy to intimidate and membership of the IRA. Sentence, 25 years. Thomas McFeely, armed robbery, possession of arms. Sentence, 26 years. Leo Green, murder, attempted murder, wounding with intent and possession of arms. Sentence, life imprisonment, with a minimum recommendation of 25 years. The seventh hunger striker is Raymond McCartney from Londonderry. McCartney is serving life imprisonment for two murders. Now he has the support of those who march in his home city. Three years ago, people in Londonderry mourned one of the men he's convicted of murdering, Geoffrey Agate, head of the local DuPont factory. The mayor, Marlene Jefferson, remembers the effect of his death on the city. Shock and horror and a great sadness. I think the whole city was saddened by what happened. It was a man who was totally classless. Jeff Agate was as happy with the workers on the shop floor as he was with his directors in the company. And he helped to bring many other plants to this city. He was an Englishman who suddenly became a citizen of the city of Londonderry because he worked and lived in it. After the Agate murder, the Provisional IRA issued a statement. Those involved in the management of the economy serve British interests. They represent and maintain economic interests which make war necessary. Well, that is a nonsense. He, he, what he did was, he was the man who supported what we needed. He, he certainly worked hard for industry and for commerce, but it was for this city. Raymond McCartney, the man convicted of the Agate shooting, has set himself on the road to Republican martyrdom. Now aged 26, he spent the last eight years of his life fighting the British. McCartney's family have one political wish, a united Ireland. His grandfather, James Gallagher, was in the IRA for more than 50 years. He was interned in the 1920s. These handwritten statements by Raymond McCartney were smuggled out from the Mays prison. We read from them. From an early age, my grandfather James Gallagher used to tell us little folklore stories and that someday Ireland would be a beautiful country, but this could not be until it was free. Gallagher spent the last 30 years of his life trying to get Catholics in Londonderry registered to vote in local government elections. The failure to achieve one man, one vote was a prime cause of the civil rights march in Londonderry in 1968, the first sign of the troubles ahead. The McCartney family were among the marchers. No different from anybody else, I suppose. October 1968 seemed to change a lot of things for me, and the lead up to the big riot of August 1969 came on me all of a sudden. I was 14 at the time, but I can remember the fierce rioting because I was frequently in my grandmother's home, which faces what is known as Free Dairy Wall. I can remember police charging in the hundreds, and 
I knew that these men showed no mercy to the people of Derry. It's hard to describe what I thought at first, soldiers in the streets, but they were there. I suppose everybody was happy because we thought we were being saved by them against the RUC. Although my grandfather James's words rang true that it would not be long before they too would become a green-clad RUC. By the beginning of 1972, a widespread IRA bombing and shooting campaign was underway. In Londonderry, one incident gave the provisionals their opportunity to increase recruiting and step up the offensive. On Sunday, January the 30th, British paratroopers shot dead 13 civilians at an anti-internment demonstration. It became known as Bloody Sunday. A government report said the soldiers' shooting had bordered on the reckless. One of the dead was Raymond McCartney's cousin, Jim Ray. We read again from McCartney's statements. After the march, I headed for my Aunt Sadie's home. I knew by this stage there were a few people dead, but I didn't know the news that was awaiting. I was told that my cousin Jim could be among the dead, and in fact he was. That incident was a hard blow, not just on me, but on everybody, because we all know that it was nothing more than murder. Later that year, McCartney joined the IRA. In October, he was driving with two friends when their car was stopped at an army checkpoint. Inside, soldiers found a gun. McCartney was found to have one round of ammunition in his pocket. He was sentenced to six months in prison. His parents were surprised at his conviction. I was shocked because, as I say, he was at college and he'd come home at four o'clock and he was in studying from that day about eight or nine o'clock at night. Well, I was very broken hearted, like the fact of women having to go to jail. But as he was found with a bullet in his pocket, did that surprise you? Well, not really, because you can pick a bullet up in the street at any stage. This was McCartney's first visit to Long Kesh. He served his sentence as a special category prisoner. In early 1973, he was released. The IRA campaign was at its height. The security forces believed that McCartney was involved and his freedom was short-lived. In October 1973, McCartney returned to Long Kesh. He was interned without trial. Life inside was, I suppose, not the worst. I was treated well as a political prisoner, though the huts were not the greatest of accommodation. After internment ended, McCartney had a full year of freedom in 1976. The provisional IRA stepped up their campaign. In Londonderry, the murder rate doubled. World in Action has been shown an intelligence report drawn up at the time, which details the role the security forces believe McCartney to be playing. McCartney is Director of Operations in Londonderry Brigade Staff Provisional IRA. He has knowledge of all major incidents in his operational area. He is also active in terrorist incidents. Subject is an ex-detainee. In January 1977, an IUC Special Branch detective, Patrick McNulty, was shot dead by IRA gunmen at a Londonderry garage. The intelligence report says that a suspect told police that McCartney was involved in that murder. Six days later, the head of the DuPont factory, Geoffrey Agate, was murdered by two gunmen as he returned home from work. He was shot seven times. An unnamed source linked McCartney to the Agate killing. Subject was sourced as being involved in that murder. A police operation was set up, and McCartney was arrested with other associates. The morning after his arrest, McCartney was taken to Castle Ray Interrogation Centre in Belfast. According to police evidence, McCartney dictated a statement confessing to the murders of Agate and McNulty. He initialed the caution at the head of the statement, but refused to sign the statement itself. McCartney claimed he was beaten up. An outside doctor who examined him agreed with his claims that he'd been assaulted. The doctor found an abrasion one and a quarter inches long at the centre of his forehead, and that his right cheekbone area was inflamed and slightly swollen. We read McCartney's reaction to his interrogation. When I initialed that statement, I was completely demoralised because I knew I had an uphill battle in the Diplock courts. But when you've been beaten and interrogated for hours, it is something hard to fight against, and you then depend that the court will believe you. At his trial, McCartney denied the charges, but the judge was satisfied that his confession had been given freely. He was found guilty of the murders of Constable McNulty and Geoffrey Agate and sentenced to life imprisonment. In February 1979, McCartney began his sentence in the H-blocks of Long Kesh, now renamed the Mays Prison. 
This time he was not a special category prisoner, but a criminal. The majority of prisoners conformed to prison rules, lived in modern accommodation and worked in the prison workshops. But McCartney joined over 300 IRA men sentenced as criminals who were fighting for political status. They made five demands, the right to wear their own clothes, to do no prison work, to associate freely with each other, to extra education and recreation, and to have full remission of their sentence restored despite breaking prison rules. McCartney went on the blanket, refusing to wear prison clothes. He smeared the walls of his cell with food and his own excrement. For a year and a half, McCartney and other convicted IRA men lived in these self-inflicted conditions, trying to force the British government into making concessions. Two prisoners shouted their demands when we visited the maze. Outside the prison, the provisionals launched a huge propaganda campaign. Pamphlets and pictures were sent abroad alleging torture. The prison authorities emphatically deny these claims. Inside Northern Ireland, the IRA started to shoot prison warders and officials. In all, 19 were killed. The prisoners took their case to the European Commission for Human Rights, which reported in June of this year that they were not entitled to political status under national or international law. The Commission also found that the British government could have been more flexible in its response to the protest. For two years, the IRA men threatened to go on hunger strike. Bishop Edward Daly and Cardinal Thomas O'Fee, the two most influential Catholic priests in Northern Ireland, tried to bring about a compromise. On the eve of the hunger strike, the government said all prisoners in Northern Ireland could wear civilian-type clothes supplied by the prison authorities. It was not enough. The hunger strike started. We were given permission to speak to McCartney and allowed to ask him one question. You and your colleagues have been convicted of murders and bombings. Why should you have any special treatment? Uh, the whole system in Northern Ireland, both special arrest, special court system without jury has proved to us beyond all doubt that these courts are set up. They convict men just to convince people that we are criminals, which we are not. We are a product of the political troubles in Northern Ireland at this moment. And uh, the reason why we went on hunger strike is because after four years of long protesting in which we embarked on the dirty protest, after long talks between Cardinal Fee and Bishop Edward Daly, we felt that our position had to be highlighted and the only way left us was by hunger strike. Can you support your son going on a hunger strike, deliberately deciding to die? Well, look, I must obey by my son's wishes. And if he thinks he can do good for the rest of the boys sitting on the protest, well, then I must accept it. If he dies, do you really think it will achieve anything? Well, that remains to be seen. So far, the demonstrations in support of the hunger strikers have been peaceful. But there has already been a shooting attack on H-block demonstrators by loyalists and murder attempts on Catholics in West Belfast. As the seven hunger strikers near death, the loyalist paramilitary organizations fear a government sellout. They've admitted that they're preparing to go on the offensive. John McMichael of the Ulster Defence Association. Well, we think that this will develop into uh, riots, burning, killings, shootings. The provisional IRA will emerge uh, hopefully, from their point of view, as the defenders of the nationalist people. If it reaches a stage where there's total breakdown in law and order, the loyalist paramilitaries must intervene, and they must take control of their own areas and defend their own people. We, and my six comrades, are prepared to go through with this, and we are prepared today to prove that we are special prisoners, and. Our five busy demands are just. 
it could come up to a point where the loyalist paramilitaries, uh, when it reaches total breakdown in law and order, may have to, and probably will have to, go into the Republican areas and take out the leadership of the revolt. I'm sorry, what does that mean? It means eliminate. This is a war, and as long as the British administration tries to fight it as a law and order campaign, as if it's a giant crime wave, the provost and any other nationalist, Irish nationalist, uh, paramilitary organisation will always have the upper hand. This is a war, and unless the British accepted it as a war and prepared to fight it as a war, there will never be a solution. On the result of this particular struggle will depend the future political shape of this island and the future shape of relations, political relations between this island and Britain. It is as important as that. They all understand it. We cannot afford to lose this one. If the hunger strike persists, the seven prisoners are likely to reach a critical condition around Christmas. If they die, the security forces expect a renewed IRA military campaign, but they claim they can handle it. The British government seems set on a final test of strength with the IRA. With all sides locked into confrontation, we asked Michael Allison, Northern Ireland minister with responsibility for prisons, if there was any way out. We will not make any concessions to blackmail. And if they are fighting for a great issue of principle as they see it, political status, then they are banging their head against a brick wall. But if they are in a muddled way saying we want better prison conditions, well, then this is a different story. I mean, we have done a great deal along those lines already. What happens when one of them dies? Well, he dies. He's carried out in a coffin as the protesting prisoners, the fasting prisoners in the Republic, in Dublin, were carried out in coffins in 1940, and it's a tragedy for the man and his family. But and what, uh, nothing changes so far as the conduct of our of responsible government in the province is concerned. And what happens when the second man, or the third man, or the fourth man dies? Again, I can only refer you to precedent. It's happened in Ireland in the past, and, and de democratically elected, civil government goes on. Is the government's principle of treating IRA men as common criminals worth the civilian bloodshed on the streets uh, that many predict uh, will happen? It is the only way in the long run that we can protect innocent lives because if we treat murder as murder and those who commit murder as criminals then we have some hope in the end of persuading people that this is a course and a method of action which is profitless. But if we say both your, objection, your objectives and to some extent your murderous and brutal methods can be specially recognised and given a special dispensation, then the risk is a far greater one to the innocent men, women and children who walk the streets of Belfast and other towns in Ireland. <laughs>